Hello, everyone. This lecture, we will talk about energy demand. This is uh, another massive topic. So I'll try to capture the main message and the fundamentals. So build on that, you can do some further readings or study. Some sample analytical questions based on uh, this week's or this lecture that I hope you can address questions like, what will be the load or energy demand in the New York ISO service area in 2030, for example, or even 2050, and that's uh, even far away from uh, the projection thing. And how electric vehicle will change the load from two dimensions. Uh, one is magnitude, uh, how much more electricity, for example, we need to satisfy the charging of an EV. And second is the temporal distribution, because when we charge, EV, some EV can even discharge electricity back to the grid when needed. So it would uh, um, change the, it shift the load. And if we add the uh, market behavior like uh, off charge during uh, charge when the price are low and uh, discharge when the prices are high, that even add more complexity in those uh, projections. And what drives energy demand growth? Um, is it a population? Is it technology? It is uh, more appliances or economic development, industry, or even climate change as the next question, how climate change changes energy demand. Um, different places have uh, uh, impact uh, differently by climate change, where um, you have higher temperature during summer, you would need more energy for cooling during winter season, you might need less energy for heating. Um, and last time we discussed the climate change can change supply because efficiency impact and, and uh, the impact on cooling and other impacts. Climate change can impact demand too. Uh, next question such as how to make a reasonable uh, assumptions about appliances stock turnover or vehicle stock turnover. When um, electric vehicle can replace ice uh, in internal combustion vehicles, uh, appliances can be uh, when the energy efficient appliances can replace old appliances or heat pump dryer, for example, can replace uh, traditional uh, electric or even gas powered uh, dryer. Those are the some uh, sample analytic questions that you may get a sense uh, from this lecture. And in each lecture, I post some sample analytic question and hope that um, those questions and provide some inspiration for your um, uh, final project. I, those are the topics that you can choose to study for your final project. Some uh, you may be able to find in literature, some um, is less studied. And if you have put some source on, uh, potential data you can find, and you may be able to do some interesting work in those domain. 
uh, all are very interesting. So I'll post more instructions on your um, final project, proposal, uh, presentation, and final paper. Uh, but those are some yeah, inspiration <laughs> questions that I hope uh, we'll give you some uh, thoughts. Here is an example uh, of a Germany's energy demand as compared to uh, the GDP growth, uh, electricity consumption, primary energy consumption, and greenhouse gas emission. Um, key message here, uh, Germany was able to, uh, this is uh, since 1990 to 2020, and it standardized uh, or compared the level of, uh, or normalized, compared the level of uh, uh, 1990. As you can see here, it's electricity generation uh, basically uh, stayed the same uh, compared to 1990 level, but it, it, yeah, it's grow and then decrease. But uh, in 2020, it's about the same. Uh, Gross power consumption, while GDP grew by 150%. Primary energy that decreased, then mainly driven by renewables because uh, less efficiency lost in renewables and uh, greenhouse gas emission also reduced by nine, uh, about 60%. So that's quite an achievement. And um, this is an example for uh, Germany. You can check data for other countries might uh, have different story, but the overarching goal for us is to um, power or uh, energize our economy while reduce the impact or even reduce the consumption. Uh, so that is to, um, bring up how we really understand those dynamics. There are two fundamental um, different philosophies or in, in, in understanding or in uh, studying those questions. One is top down and the other is bottom up. Um, here is an example to study residential energy consumption, how to do it. So, two different uh, philosophies, two different methods. One is top-down uh, to get some uh, high-level social economic uh, technological um, insights and use those parameters to project. Uh, it has advantage because you only rely on a few parameters, uh, make it comparatively easy to collect data and to do the projection. Uh, at the same time, it has limitations. If there is any structure change on those um, key parameters, then uh, it may change the whole uh, projection. And bottom up. Bottom up offers more um, uh, Data, uh, it requires more data. Very often it has very detailed inventory of uh, appliances, uh, energy consuming goods. Um, it also has two different ways. One is statistical, one is engineering. In both cases, you would need uh, very much more data in order to do that. Um, in the engineering approach, for example, uh, in order to study residential energy consumption, you would, you would need uh, inventory data of all the uh, population, uh, their income level, and their energy consuming behavior, and appliances stock, um, the e efficiency level, and the stock turnover, and how much each year uh, those energy apply, uh, consuming uh, goods or appliances would be replaced by more efficiency. So we can make reasonable assumptions on their uh, efficiency. And to add all of them together, uh, we got the total uh, residential energy consumption, for example. Uh, 
So two fundamental different methods, okay? both are fine. Uh, it depends uh, which direction you, you choose and what the limitation you can uh, accept. You would see these two uh, approaches uh, in different situations. One a top down example is so called um, the iPad formula. Uh, it was first discussed in a very uh, impact paper, as I put here, Enrich and uh, John Holdren, published in 1971 in the Journal of Science, to discuss the, uh, how we quantify the impact of human activities. So I is impact equals P multiplied by A and T and P is population. A is influence. Very often we use GDP to represent our influence and technology is how much different technologies we use. To. So we keep adding more technology, right? Appliances, computers, internet, goods, and all each technology we involve new category of energy consumption. At the same time, technology can help this formula, uh, which means that we can use technology to improve efficiency, to reduce the intensity, and um, it can contribute reducing the impact. So um, the new developments of the app app function uh, tend to move T from numeric to to uh, denominator. Um, so then higher technology, you use the less impact we would have to the environment. Uh, they are also uh, to try to include other factors in, a, in addition to factors discussed here um, on the behavior and other uh, even culture uh, impact. So, uh, create a more advanced or sophisticated about well, iPads uh, is the first um, insight that captured a top-down approach and it still offer insights to uh, understand the uh, our uh, impact uh, to the uh, uh, nature environment. Uh, population uh, itself, it's a huge area to uh, for study and uh, uh, it involves uh, quite a lot of uh, um, sociology and um, culture and uh, um, the, how population really evolve. And uh, there are hot topics like to study aging, society, and um, the um, regeneration rate and um, the gender inequality, many of the important topics. Uh, but here we mostly focus on uh, using population as an um, input or indicator to understand implications for energy use. So if we make reasonable uh, assumptions on per capita, energy use average right? globally or by country and projection to the future and multiple by the projections of a population, yeah. then we can get some reasonable estimation of a total energy consumption in the world. But that rely on um, a more or less a reasonable projection of the population as you can see here within the even within the 95 prediction interval, um, it still has huge uh, discrepancy by 20, uh, 200, 2100 year between about 12 billion population and 9 billion population. That's 3 billion population differences. And many countries have uh, entering the aging society and those all have implications on our uh, energy consumption uh, to their 
energy consuming activities, uh, the service needed to provide uh, to help those populations. Economy, uh, affluence in the um, iPad function. Um, this is the example uh, which comes from a paper that I worked with my collaborators at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, we studied the relationship between uh, electricity consumption per capita and GDP per capita, as you can see here. And different provinces has very different economic structure. Therefore, their um, electricity consumption per capita and uh, GDP per capita uh, follow very different pattern. For rich provinces, more rely on service province, provinces, as you can see here, their electricity consumption per capita gradually plateaued, even uh, their GDP still growing. And for uh, resource, uh, more heavy industry based uh, economy provinces that uh, their per capita uh, electricity consumption still in the high growth, as you can see here. So those offer some pattern on the relationship, um, how the GDP can contribute um, or the structure of the economy can contribute to energy consumption. Um, so without digging into uh, such details, uh, let's say if we uh, put China as a whole, then uh, it, it cannot show such nuance uh, or complexity in, in the discussion of uh, energy demand. So that brings to uh, the discussion of uh, energy intensity. How can we make uh, projections of future uh, energy intensity in general? Uh, let's uh, see uh, world average uh, as example. Uh, this data from our world in data. Um, it's a fantastic website for uh, all kinds of uh, uh, data. And it shows from 1960s to 2018. And in general, the energy intensity has uh, decreasing. Uh, which means that we need less energy to produce one uh, dollar of uh, uh, GDP or in PPP power purchase um, power um, GDP. So, and from in the 60s, about 2.5 kilowatt hour to uh, 2018, about 1.5 kilowatt hour. Different countries follow different uh, pathway, but mostly are, uh, are decreasing due to the fact of a, uh, a restructuring of its economic structure and uh, the improvement of energy efficiency and um, the regu regulation change to uh, encourage more uh, efficient products. As I mentioned, um, in the overarching strategy to confront climate change, there is a fundamental to electrify our energy use. Uh, that's the electrification. And then to decarbonize our electricity. And electrification presents a, a, a very important uh, indicator that how much electricity we would need. And that depends also, that also depends how much our energy use is electrified, right? So in this chart, Norway has the highest electric electrification rate. Uh, electricity accounts about half of its total uh, final energy use. And um, this uh, top 10 countries in their uh, by 2021, uh, electric, how electricity uh, share in their 
total finite energy use, Sweden, Kuwait, and other um, parts of the world. And as you can see, uh, let's say in the decarbonization scenarios by 2050, electrification might account more than 80% of the final total energy use. Uh, that presents, uh, and we can make assumptions uh, using this, then we can have better idea if we do projections of future electricity demand. Then electrification rate is a very important uh, parameter that we need to set up. Um, my other example is uh, EV. As I mentioned, EV has uh, two uh, fundamental uh, impact on our energy demand. One is the magnitude. Second is the distribution of the node. So this is a study by McKenzie. And uh, as you can see here, uh, electric node or charging behavior um, by EV, um, when the local EV penetration hits about 25%, uh, peak nodes can grow about 30%. As you see here, that's the uh, maximum EV demand compared to the base uh, demand that without EV, uh, most due to the uh, charging behavior. Uh, when the cars are uh, at home after uh, uh, in, in the light time, right? But you can create, we can create incentives, uh, price signals, time of use price. So you can shift some of the charging uh, to the midnight, for example, where the node is high, uh, is low. And uh, so, uh, the fast charging stations, as you can see here, charging station uh, utilization rate, when you have uh, the observed day, weekend, week, uh, weekend, uh, weekday pattern, and the, the daily uh, day and light pattern. And um, so the maximum first, uh, at the, Average versus a maximum nodes as offer you uh, the insights of the uh, variability of this charging behavior, and that create a uh, a challenge for for the uh, grid to manage, and really need to optimize and uh, using regulatory market technology uh, work together to uh, harvest the benefits of a. Uh, EV wire reducing its uh, potential impact to the grid. Uh, this is a, a very active area to uh, for further study. Uh, one other uh, uh, very important factor, uh, if we think about the top down and and bottom up approaches, is the role of energy efficiency. Um, it was uh, when it's called uh, first fuel, uh, which means that one kilowatt hour saved is equivalent to one kilowatt hour generated. Uh, if we really think about it, um, that's why uh, energy efficiency is called uh, first fuel. And uh, no matter in which uh, sector, Industry building, transport, those are the three uh, uh, con uh, energy consuming uh, sectors, uh, fine, final energy consuming sectors. Um, and each sector um, uh, offers the different potential of uh, uh, energy efficiency. As you can see here, IEA in its uh, energy efficiency study, their projections of uh, um, future potential of uh, energy efficiency. And by 2050, a much larger percentage of it can be uh, saved or the energy demand can be reduced by 
uh, in energy efficiency measures. Uh, that's uh, very important when we think about how much uh, energy we really need. Uh, from uh, my previous stud uh, study or observation, uh, just give you an example. Uh, I see different projections of uh, um, energy or electricity demand uh, by 2050 in China and the highest compared to the lowest projection. Uh, it's about the lowest can be just one third of the highest. And that partially uh, based on different assumptions, of energy efficiency, technology, and all the factors. Just think about that. Um, uh, the demand can be reduced to a, just about one third of, the, of uh, the baseline or busy sets here. Um, and that makes a lot of differences. Uh, if uh, demand can be reduced by all those measures, then you don't need to build a new power plants in the first place, right? Um, so that's uh, the role of the energy efficiency. Also hot. Um, Another approach uh, is the bottom up, right? And the bottom up, as I mentioned, relies on a detailed inventory of all the energy consuming products, goods, appliances, uh, devices. And the more detail we know about those devices or appliances, the better we can make assumption, assumption. At the same time, we need to uh, project the penetration uh, rate over time. And how can we do that? And this relies on the so-called uh, adopt, adoption curve. And uh, the, uh, for any products or innovation, it has uh, Innovators, early adopters, early majority, later majority, and the lacker. And that's a more, more or less a, a normal distribution curve. And accumulation is a logistic curve uh, to, to do the penetration rate uh, in the population. For example, now probably we'll have 100% of penetration of population in many countries. Uh, to have electricity, uh, in many places they have cell phone, uh, access to internet, for example. It follows a very similar uh, curve and it's just getting faster and faster, right? So uh, using the historic data and insights from uh, previous studies, uh, we can make reasonable uh, projections of how products can be penetrated in the total population. So we know um, how the devices uh, will consume electricity over time, especially when we project uh, the future demand. Uh, the data we have very often based on historic data, but with reasonable assumptions uh, uh, using the adaptation curve, we can make project future penetration rate. It's very similar to the idea of uh, the learning curve, which we can use future uh, build out of uh, renewables, renewable capacities to project the future prices of those uh, renewables. And adaptation, adoption uh, curve, we can use uh, the key parameters that we get from historic penetration and project the future rate. So using those, the penetration rate, uh, the efficiency improvements or efficiency, then we can calculate uh, the energy need uh, by devices, by uh, energy consuming goods. Um, and that very often offer better uh, because we know where the energy is consumed. We know exactly, but at, at, at the same time, the risks is, um, is the technology 
uh, follow that pattern. And uh, we are new technology uh, jump in and uh, how, how, how the bug. In any case, uh, this is an insightful uh, empirical uh, curve that can help us uh, make reasonable assumptions for um, reasonable uh, estimation. When we talk about uh, energy efficiency, uh, you, you might hear the word rebound. Uh, rebound describes the phenomenon that uh, when energy efficiency improves, we spend less on uh, energy, uh, energy becomes cheaper, and we tend to use more energy. Um, it's observed in the uh, uh, driving uh, vehicle uh, miles increase when vehicle efficiency improves. Uh, that's an example of the rebound effect. Uh, here is a, uh, a chart to explain the idea uh, and the linkage between um, the uh, technology efficiency improvement and uh, we might end uh, consuming more energy. Uh, that's not that, that's a very a typical unintended consequences you can imagine, right? Uh, but uh, rebound uh, might exist. Uh, there are quite a lot of literature uh, showing that. And the real question is how big uh, is the rebound? Uh, here I need a few uh, literatures that you can get a sense of uh, what is rebound and how uh, rebound is observed and from historic data and how big is rebound and should we worry about rebound. We definitely need, need to take rebound into consideration, but it's not an excuse for not doing energy efficient measures, right? And uh, there are also some good rebound because uh, let's say if we save money for um, other activities, it's an improvement of life quality. And it's also in uh, contribution to the economy. So those are good rebound, right? Um, uh, at the same time, rebound might um, create more uh, emissions, uh, pollutions. Those are though the rebound that uh, we need to worry about. Uh, so uh, the discussion of a rebound is also an active Active, very active area for research. Uh, if you're interested, I definitely encourage you to read more. And GDP, uh, what's the assumption of the GDP? They are uh, evolving uh, philosophies or ideas and how we um, think about uh, GDP or uh, growth. In the 70s, uh, the limit to growth uh, created by a club in Rome, a few scientists really published um, uh, the very important, very uh, influential report, limit to growth, uh, based on the idea that um, we have limited resource and population experience exponential growth. And when we reach the resource limit and population would clash. So that's where the limit to growth come in. Um, the clash might not happen all yet. Um, mostly because we always find the alternatives. We find uh, the economy, economic really drive uh, new resources becomes available or becomes um, cheaper. And if it's too expensive, we find alternatives. Technology plays a huge role. And uh, human society is still growing. 
And there also a uh, discussion on D growth. Uh, maybe. So we don't need it because we are pursuing people pursue happiness. We don't need always need to grow to uh, as uh, the um, aspiration to grow to uh, make people happy, right? Um, so uh, they they the discussion over uh, degrowth to to really uh, satisfy uh, the um, the needs of a growth um, and uh, the green growth is um, we still need to grow our GDP to make um, people have uh, decent living, uh, especially the large population in the world still don't even have access to electricity. Uh, no need to say access to um, basic need of uh, services. Uh, and uh, green growth is still grow our GDP while uh, through a more uh, green way, uh, through uh, renewable energy, through um, sustainable uh, economy, and uh, to mitigate our impact to the environment, to reduce our uh, carbon emissions. And uh, that's the idea of uh, green growth. From limited growth to degrowth to green growth offer uh, 50 years of arguments and uh, debate. Uh, some very uh, thought provoking um, books, ideas that are all in, embedded in this long history of involvement. It's uh, some touch the some of the fundamental ideas of a human being and how we organize our economy and what's the purpose of uh, um, our society or our, our economy. And uh, very interesting, uh, what indicators should we use to um, uh, show our uh, progress uh, from GDP to uh, Human Development Index, for example, to true genius uh, grow progress index to human happiness in, in index, uh, for example. Uh, those are uh, very interesting discussion there. Uh, I mentioned uh, there's another uh, group of uh, scholars try to um, define decent living uh, that we don't we may don't need a that much growth, we don't need to keep adding new stuff that we don't we don't really need. Uh, but this even is a, an idea to try to quantify what's the basic needs that can satisfy our um, daily life to to provide a decent living. And uh, there are difficulties. It's how decent decent is decent, right? Uh, but there are some uh, fundamentals, uh, basically it's as a human being, um, based on the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of uh, human needs, right? Um, and all those basics involve energy consuming activities, products, and um, it can come up with reasonable assumptions, uh, how much energy needed to provide those fundamentals. And uh, we need to say uh, human needs, it's keeping adding new things. Uh, 50 years ago, we don't have computer, uh, don't have personal computer, internet, or you know, um, those energy consuming goods on your iPhone or, or whatever phone. And now we, we keep adding new devices, maybe a pad or, or, or watch or whatever. All those consume energy. But at the same time, energy efficiency improve, energy 
technology improve and um, total household uh, per uh, consumption, electricity consumption per household is uh, plateaued. Um, so which means technology still drives the changes with the same electricity level we can support more, uh, satisfy more need, uh, need or diversify need. Uh, so we need two directions to work together uh, in those frontier. But in, in any case, decent living is a, uh, another a very interesting idea uh, how we can maintain a decent standards of uh, uh, life quality and at the same time reduce our e electricity or energy footprint. Human behavior really has an impact in uh, shaping our demand. Uh, here is an example, uh, a very recent example, as you see, California in September 6th experienced high heat. So uh, the AC load really drives the uh, peak and the demand. And the, see, California ISO sent demand response uh, notice to all, all the cell phones and it significantly reduced many people they can adjust their thermostat to a higher temperature so uh, California ISO was able to manage the node without uh, creating blackout so at the peak uh, maximum time about two to three gigawatt is curtailed I mean demand is curtailed through demand response. Um, and that saves the grid from blackout. Uh, so that's uh, very efficient, very powerful uh, through the demand response. And with today's technology, communication technology, control technology, all those, uh, it, it can be achieved. Uh, so uh, there is always a human behavior factor uh, in the demand, uh, especially if uh, the critical peak is only a few hours and uh, there are ranges that those adjustments can achieve. Uh, with some rebates or economic incentives, uh, this is even more attractive or doable. Um, what are the uh, interventions, uh, human behavior interventions can contribute. For example, real-time feedback, that's through uh, text messages, phone, so you know um, when such behavior change is needed. Uh, home energy reports, um, electricity or, or gas, competitions in, and the mere fact of that to add how you, your house energy efficiency of your house is compared with your uh, neighboring houses can create an incentive for you to take actions. And um, those are examples, right? Uh, uh, many utility studies adding those informations that can help you. And then peer effect, if your neighbor installs solar panel, uh, more likely that you will be impacted to, to start and think about why don't I install a solar panel. That's uh, driven by examples or informations because you communicate with each other, right? So that brings back to the, uh, for utility companies or ISOs, the uh, ISO is the independent uh, system operator, they really need to do load forecasting for planning purposes, for operation purposes. Uh, load forecasting is really a not an engineering and science that bring together all the pieces that we discuss, uh, top down, bottom up, different factors, different uh, drivers, all together to make um, the electricity delivery possible uh, reliably, safely, 
cheaply, affordably, um, and plan the system so it can satisfy the need for future uh, demand, right? So uh, this chart really summarize uh, the time, the temporal landscape of node effect uh, forecasting from demand response from a uh, second to decade, uh, demand response, our head of scheduling, they had scheduling those are within a day and unit commitment, energy trading, that's very often a uh, week, months, uh, within a year, system planning, energy policy, policy. I really discuss uh, year and decades, so different uh, time frame. Uh, they the lead for load forecasting, and we did all of this uh, when we uh, think about uh, to make the system work. And what are the factors uh, here? It summarizes uh, uh, for load forecast. If you build a model. Uh, what uh, you need. Uh, this, uh, if you check, uh, for example, ISO New England or PGM, that's another ISO or uh, no surface area, you, you can see that uh, what are the factors that really uh, ISOs are considering. For example, uh, weather condition, uh, calendar, week, weekday, weekend, uh, different economic conditions, uh, structure of the economy, uh, consumer behavior, and distribute solo, plug in electric vehicles, uh, different energy consuming products, uh, different income groups, uh, location, weather, and all come together. Uh, so load forecast, it's really combined engineering technology policy and uh, data science. It's written engineering art that I, as I mentioned. Uh, if you are interested, this is really an, an area that I can bring all the knowledge, insights, and together to really contribute to the operation planning of the grid. Um, that's an amazing area to work on. So to, uh, to summarize what we have discussed, um, energy demand is shaped by dynamic factors, uh, population, GDP, technology, regulation, human behavior. And uh, we have two fundamental different approaches to really understand it. One is top down. Uh, we focus on key uh, macro level of indicators uh, such as APAC uh, function. And while the other is to really put a, a detailed um, energy consumed goods, uh, devices, inventory, and make assumptions about their penetration and efficiency. So we can get uh, a really detailed understanding of uh, where our energy consumption comes from. So understanding those drivers will help us to know the magnitude and the shape of our demand. Um, and EV as example, it really shows how it can uh, impact our node. Uh, and node forecasting integrates all insights and it's, it's, a, it's a great value to show our understanding and progress in all the frontiers. So understanding the demand and projecting the demand is an engineering and a science uh, and uh, an art uh, that we can say. Um, so that's all for uh, this lecture. And uh, here are a few uh, references that uh, you may find uh, useful. So I definitely recommend you to uh, check out, read more, uh, and uh, you, you will know a lot from uh, those discussions. Um, thank you.